So uh, it took us five weeks to go through uh, the first five books of uh, the Old Testament. And today we're going to kind of put our accelerators on and move through the books of Joshua through hopefully 2 Samuel and if possible even a little, little further. So I'm going to go on a faster pace, but some of the narrative uh, events here may not be as familiar with all of you. So if there is something that's not clear, please stop me and then we'll slow down. If not, I'll, I'll uh, try to maintain a rather fast pace. So if you can open your Bibles to the book of Joshua, we will uh, continue with the uh, with our study of the Old Testament. So we finished the Pentateuch, the first five books that you see here. Uh, now we are entering the historical books. So this week and next week, we'll be covering all of these books, at least the main points or the central theme of these books as we go from uh, Joshua all the way to Esther. And uh, last week when we uh, finished with Deuteronomy, we are on the other side of the River Jordan um, on Mount Nebo. We have uh, Moses uh, dying. And once again, we didn't touch upon this, but M Moses does not get to enter the promised land because of his disobedience. And the disobedience itself is pretty straightforward. Uh, the first time when the people asked for water, God asked Moses to strike the rock with his rod. And then the second uh, and the later time when uh, the people once again complain for water, this time God tells him to speak to the rock. And then uh, Moses is frustrated with the people and then he strikes it. And then uh, that is given as a reason for his disobedience and not entering the promised land. And here Moses actually does get to see the promised land, but he just doesn't get to enter it. And again, um, we touched a little bit upon the symbolism of the rock being uh, Christ, which followed them, and uh, Christ is the one who provides for them, uh, both in the um, wilderness as well as uh, when we come in the New Testament, the parallels that point back to this. So here we have Moses dying, and now the, Joshua is the next leader who takes up the mantle after him. Joshua is not a prophet like Moses was, but he is the leader of the nation, and he's the general who has been with Moses uh, through a bulk of his uh, life. He, uh, if you remember the age of Moses, Moses was uh, 40 years old when he goes into Midian. He's 80 years old when he comes back to uh, Egypt. And then it's, he's 120 years old now when he is dying. He's 40 years of the wilderness. Joshua was 40 years old when he left Egypt. And uh, Joshua has now been with Moses for 40 years. He's, he was one of the two spy, one of the 12 spies who went into the promised land and brought a good report. He is with jo Moses in the, in the, up in the mountain. He is uh, the general who fights uh, the battles under Moses. So he is one of those men who has been in training all this time. But now he is the one who God picks uh, to lead the people across the river and into uh, Canaan. Now, as the book of Joshua begins, uh, I think this verse 8 is very important. Uh, here we have uh, God speaking to Joshua and giving him a charge as the new leader in terms of what he must do um, as they are getting ready to follow God into the promised land. And so here he says, this book of the law, the law, the Torah that has been given to him by Moses, who's written it down, it shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. So uh, what is the means of success for this people of God as they're entering the promised land? It's not about their battle strategies or their economic plans, but rather about uh, their faithfulness to the word of God, uh, not just to uh, he uh, hear it, not just to speak it, but to meditate on it and to live by it. And then you have verse 9. Uh, uh, Joshua is uh, strengthened by the Lord. He says, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. And this theme will repeat itself through this book where God strengthens Joshua and asks him to be courageous because of the person who is leading them. It is not Joshua's own might or how much, how far below Moses he is as a leader, but rather it is the same Lord who is going to take them uh, into this promised land. So he says, do not, do not tremble and be not dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that is our confidence here as well, that God is with us. No matter what circumstance of life we are, God is our strength 
and uh, we can be courageous in the way we live our lives. But this is a major undertaking, completely foreign land, lots of battles to be fought. What's going to happen? So the first uh, city that they're going to uh, attack is Jericho. And um, again, this is a very famous story, so I'm not going to talk, touch upon all the details. But this time, um, um, Joshua, as the general, sends only two spies, unlike the 12 that were sent last time. Uh, you know, last time, or two of the 12 did a good job. So it's like the other 10 are not needed this time. So two go to Jericho. It's a walled city. So they get into this um, place with Rahab, who's a prostitute. But she tells them about the fear of the Israelites that has taken a hold of all the people. What God had done 40 years ago in, in splitting the Red Sea, still understood. And and they were in, uh, in terror of the Israelites who are camped across the Jordan. And uh, asks Rahab to... Uh, give up the two men, she she deceives the king, and then lets the two men escape. And the two men uh, promise to her that um, uh, she will be safe, she and her family, if she would stay in this house and have a red cord outside her window. And this red uh, scarlet cord or the scarlet thread of redemption is what we would see uh, throughout the throughout the books of the Bible. And, uh, and one of the st startling things that we notice is it is not the ones who are the most holy or the most righteous, but it is the dregs of the earth that God calls, gives them faith, and then enable and brings, saves them by His own um, mercy. And uh, Rahab will be in the line, the genealogy of Jesus Himself. So you have uh, now the two men who go across and then uh, bring a good report, and then Joshua is now ready to um, uh, cross over. And then once again, you have another miracle where. The Jordan River is stopped as the men carrying that uh, tabernacle, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, step into the river, and then the entire um, nation crosses over. And Jericho, as you know, falls once again supernaturally. Uh, seven days, uh, the Israelites cross, uh, circle the la uh, circle the um, town, and then uh, the seventh day they do it seven times, and then these walls of Jericho fall down, and then. Uh, the people are destroyed except for Rahab and her family. So this is a picture of Jericho. It's uh, called a town of palms, palm trees, like an oasis, the place, uh, except uh, there is a lot of desert in that region, but this place is an oasis uh, over there. And so here you have the picture of what it could have looked like. As you know, Rahab's house was on the walls, and so she was able to let these men escape. And uh, so the very first town that they attacked, Jericho, huge town, big major victory, decimated and uh, demonstrates the power of God. We have a smaller town, uh, Ai, which is a little bit to the northwest of Jericho. Uh, the location itself is not 100% certain for the modern scholar, modern um, archaeologists as they try to excavate, but this is in the general region where Ai uh, could have been. And so uh, this time. Um, uh, Joshua sends a smaller contingent. However, what we have here is a is a major defeat. And then you kind of see some of uh, Joshua's own insecurity, and he is kind of concerned with God, and he comes back and cries out to God, uh, asking why God has done this. And then God reveals to them that this was not uh, a defeat because of their uh, poor planning, but it was a defeat because of sin. And you have the man uh, Achan, who during the Battle of Jericho had disobeyed God. Um, now, one thing that God had said in the Battle of Jericho was everything that was captured was uh, under the ban. Um, the word for that is haram. And, uh, the, uh, is, and the idea being there is everything belongs to God and must be devoted to destruction. And here this man sees... Uh, um, material things that he covets and then he takes it and hides it under his tent thinking that nobody has seen it but God has seen it and God brings judgment and then God points out this man and his family and uh, they are destroyed uh, judged for their sin and then once uh, this sin and evil is taken care of then you have um, uh, the battle at I uh, they go back and then they are able to win over the people there as well. Now, so you have two towns that are down, and then uh, what happens is, as you know, the people in Canaan are already in, in terror. 
and uh, they are afraid of the Israelites. They know that they don't have the power to match them because of the God who is with the Israelites. And Israelites come up with a deceptive plan. Um, they are very close by to the place where the Israelites are camped, but some of them pretend to be um, have travelers from a long distance, and they make a treaty with uh, with Joshua and the elders, and uh, saying that you know that they we would not attack them, and um, Joshua hastily agrees to this uh, um, to this uh, to this treaty, and then soon finds out that they are just neighbors across a few miles away. And uh, still, even though this was done deceptively, Joshua and the Israelites keep their word uh, of not uh, destroying the Gibeonites. And uh, and because of uh, <coughs> Let me just go back. So because of uh, this treaty with Gibeon, you have the other nations uh, that are surrounding this region that, that are, um, th there are going to be two wars. There's going to be a southern confederation that's going to fight against the Israelites. And later there's going to be a northern confederacy that's going to fight against the Israelites. But the southern confederates are now going to um, ally and first attack Gibeon because Gibeon is not a small town like Ai. But it is actually a big place. And so uh, because of their al alliance with Israel, they're now going to try to attack Gibeon. And what this would uh, provide for is that while Joshua is now going to go out and attack and conquer the land, this confederacy makes it easier for, um, for the Israelites to actually um, have two major battles and then take over a bulk of, the, of Canaan in, in, um, in two major battles. So the first one we see in Joshua 10, uh, 1 to 2. Now, it came about when Adoni Zedek, uh, and actually you can kind of guess the meanings of their names by now. Adonai is for master. Uh, Zedek is for, you remember Melki Zedek. Um, um, and so this Zedek is righteousness. So the, his name is at least master of righteousness. And he's the king of Jerusalem. And you will notice that Jerusalem at this point is still going to be pagan. And it will remain... Uh, not a major point, major um, Israelite town until the time of David, when David, it'll be called the city of David or the uh, or Zion or the town that will become the capital of Israel. But up until that point, you're going to see that this is going to be under uh, the um, Canaanites. So Adonis Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had captured Ai and had utterly de destroyed it just as he had done to Jericho and its king, so he had done to Ai and its king. And that the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were within their land, that he feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, like one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai and all its men were mighty. So uh, having this um, uh, problem, now Gibeon allied with Israel is a greater danger. So these kings set up a confederation. So you have uh, Jerusalem, which is uh, Adonis Zedek. He goes with, uh, takes the king, uh, kingdoms of Hebron, Lashish, Eglon, and Jamrath. And these five kingdoms from the south now uh, want to attack Gibeon. And the way they do that is they come by um, the west side and then up on the descent of Beth Horon. So you have the Israelites between Gibeon and I, and then that's where the battle is going to be fought between the two and uh, and and God as he has promised fights for the Israelites and then you have this five nations uh, destroyed in the plains as they are fought as they are fighting uh, with the Israelites so let me just read verse 11 of Joshua 10 it came about as said from before Israel while they were at the descent of Beth Horon that the Lord Lord through large stones from heaven on them. These are very big hailstones. And as far as Azekah, so this is not just a small place, it goes all the way down. Uh, as they were fleeing, that God sent these hailstones and killed them, and they died. There were more who died from the hailstones than those whom the sons of Israel killed with a sword. So God gives, once again, a mighty victory over this confederacy. Um, um, and again, the term there uh, from heaven is uh, Ad Shamayim, uh, from the skies, as it came down. So Azika, as you can see in your map here, is it's quite a bit of a distance. That there were hailstones pretty much God raining them down all the way down. And the people could see that this was not just 
uh, mighty men they were fighting, but uh, the God of Israel that was against them. Um, and uh, here you have a very strange phenomenon that happens in Joshua 10, 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered <coughs> up the Amorites. Uh, Amorites is another name of the Canaanites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ajalon. And so the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. We do not have this book of Jasher, uh, but we have a record of this additional book, which was not part of scripture, where there was a historical record of something very unusual, the sun standing still and not moving down uh, for about a whole day. Now, we don't know exactly how God did this, but it was one of those supernatural things that God did while he aided uh, the Israelites uh, to uh, destroy the Canaanites. And then verse 14, there was no day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. So you have the first major battle uh, with the Southern Confederacy and they are wiped out. And now you have the Northern Confederacy. So the, in the North, you have this term called Hazor or Hadzor. We're going to see this come up a few times this week and next week. It's a big town and uh, you have the kings of uh, Maidon, Shimron and Ashaf uh, allied with the king of Hadzor in, uh, in fighting against um, in fighting against uh, the Israelites, and once again, uh, they are delivered into the people, into the hands of the Israelites. And so with these two major battles, you have a large portion of the land freed, and then there's going to be small towns and villages across this place that are still under Canaanite uh, occupation. And uh, over time, the idea would be for the Israelites to expand and take control of all of the land. Um, part of this um, now, the Israelites' command would be to uh, not uh, intermarry with the people of the land in order to uh, absorb their customs and their false gods. Um, they are supposed to drive them out because God has judged them and the land is spitting them out. But um, the people will get content and then soon they will, be, um, they will start marrying and that's where they will now start to fall away from their God. Now, part of the uh, problem here at this point in time is that um, it was not possible for them to send away all the people right at this time. Uh, they were supposed to take major control of this land and over time uh, wipe out the rest of the people, uh, mainly because they don't have the ability to occupy uh, all the part of the land as it stands at this point. Because uh, earlier in the Pentateuch we would read that um, God would drive them out slowly uh, in order that um, you don't have unoccupied towns into which wild animals and beasts would come in. So they were supposed to, they're doing it at the right pace, but what would happen is when that stops, uh, they would not continue this process uh, that they were supposed to um, completely wipe, the, to rid the land of the false gods. All right, so here we now look at an outline of the book of Joshua, and here if you can keep your Bibles open, uh, you can just skim through this. So in the initial first five chapters, you have the commissioning of Joshua, and you have the preparations just as the land is about to be taken. And you can see the meeting with the, the 12 memorial stones as they cross over some major milestones. And then in chapter 6 to 12, you have the conquest of the land. You have Jericho, Ai, this deal with the Gibeonites. And then you have uh, the southern and the northern wars. And the land is pretty much conquered. And then you have uh, a large percentage of your chapters, if you can just skim through your Bible, you can see this, where the land is distributed through the various tribes of Israel. And um, as you know, uh, we have, uh, if you can actually open up your map for the distribution of the land, we have a pretty nice map that just shows us where each of the tribes is supposed to settle. But uh, in those days, they didn't have these maps. As you can see in the, each of these chapters, there are landmarks that are given to say, from which point to which point uh, each of the tribe owns um, is given an inheritance of this land. And this is what was promised to them, the land that was uh, to be given to the descendants of Jacob and of Israel. 
and the descendants of Abraham. And uh, these are now divided in these chapters. And then finally, uh, you have a closing appeal uh, in chapters 22 to 24. <coughs> and uh, Joshua here is, uh, is finished with his work. He's going to die at 110 years old. He uh, talks about, he reminds them of his faithfulness to the Lord and he charges them in terms of how they need to be faithful. And the covenant is actually renewed in, um, in chapter 24. And you have there, um, actually, let me go back. In, um, in the end of chapter 24, there is a strong uh, reminder to the people of God. You know, you, God has blessed you in this mighty way, bringing you here, driving out the people and giving the land to you. But you must choose this day whom you will serve. Uh, and then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Um, and then um, John does a John Stevenson does a good uh, comparison of what happens at the end of uh, Genesis and the end of Joshua. So in the end of Genesis, there is a promise. Uh, Joseph, um, you know, asked for his bones to be brought back uh, into uh, Canaan, and uh, and Joshua ends with the fulfillment of that promise. All right, with that, we come to the book of Judges. Now, before we get into the book of Judges, uh, any questions on Joshua? All right, so we have the sin cycle of Judges. Um, if you can think of your wash cycle in your clothes, you know, we have clean clothes, we go out and use them, uh, whatever we do, they get dirty. They come back, um, put some soap, put put on the cycle, it washes, it comes out, and then we start to wear them, and then it gets sin again. And uh, you see this repetition of sin in the life of the um, Israelites after the strong leader, that is Joshua under God, uh, dies. You don't have um, one leader after uh, Joshua's death, but rather a series of local leaders in each um, region in a in a region when there is a problem, uh, uh, the Lord will lift up a deliverer, uh, a judge, and then He will deal with uh, the oppression that is there, and then um, and then the people will be rescued. Let me just throw out all of these over here. So you will have the people. Uh, first, you will have sin, where the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord, and this would just be a repetitive theme. And when they sin, just as God promised. In the Pentateuch, um, he, the, he will, God will bring judgment, and the Lord sold them into the hands of their enemies. So you will have enemies from all over the place, um, from uh, um, Moab to Midian to Philistines, all across the place, people that God would come to um, uh, uh, rule over the Israelites. And then when they are under this oppression, you would see a repentance. It's this kind of chastisement that comes upon the people. And then the sons of Israel would cry out to the Lord. And then the Lord would raise up a deliverer. Now, uh, here you have, um, uh, if you had to just divide this book um, uh, in its outline, you have a prologue uh, that begins this uh, work. So you have the, uh, and I kind of touched upon this in the end of Joshua. Uh, you have the conquest of Can Canaan that continues you have some instances like how Caleb uh, talks about the uh, hill country that's uh, to be taken. And then you have a, a, a review of what has failed to be done. And then you have uh, the disobedience or the unfaithfulness of Israel right with the death of Joshua. Now, with that, you have a whole bunch of um, uh, judges. The first one we have is Othniel is a very um, uh, it's you don't have too much detail on Othniel. You have uh, the king of Mesopotamia coming up against uh, Israel because of their sin, and the people cry out, and then the Lord raises Othniel. Othniel is actually Caleb's younger brother, and then uh, he <coughs> is used to uh, get rid of this king of the Mesopotamians. And then he rules for about 40 years. And then you have uh, uh, this Ehud. He, Ehud, uh, you have a little more detail on his uh, rule. He is a social outcast, mainly because he is a left-handed uh, person. And in that culture, um, the left-handed people were treated as um, not as someone who is uh, like as a normal 
um, person, mainly because uh, the, uh, the, the, there were specific functions for the right and left hand. And uh, one of the things is, you know, you're, you use the right hand in the common meal when you are eating and uh, sharing a food with one another. And then your left hand was used for other things um, in the, you know, they didn't have toilet papers. And now when someone like this with a left-handed person, you know, it's, there's this awkwardness. And, uh, but what happens is what is his um, uh, social uh, out, I don't know, the, what makes him a social outcast becomes, comes to his advantage. And uh, when you have uh, oppressors uh, in, um, in this case, uh, from Moab, they come up, actually we should have a map here, oh, I, we don't have a map. So when you have the uh, oppressors coming from uh, Moab, uh, you have the king of uh, uh, Moab uh, who um, is waiting for the um, tributes from Israel and then Ehud goes as the representative and as you know the story, uh, he has his sword uh, on the other side of the thigh and then uh, he goes for a quiet audience with the king in the upper room uh, which is actually like the bathroom, the cool room upstairs and then when the door is locked, uh, Ehud kills the king and uh, this king is so fat that the sword just goes into his belly and then um, he delivers the people from the Moabites and then uh, he rules uh, for a little while. And then you have the case of uh, Deborah and uh, uh, Barak in chapters 4 and 5. And you have a very unusual situation here where Deborah is actually a prophetess from the Lord. You don't have normally female prophets. And in fact, some of the people today uh, in the evangelical churches would, would argue for uh, women elders using Deborah as an example. And I think, you know, trying to use a um, situation uh, uh, a narrative example from the case of, uh, especially the book of Judges, uh, to try to make a case for the New Testament church, I think is a very poor argument. But uh, Deborah herself uh, receives the word from the Lord and calls upon Barak to go and fight against. Um, uh, this is this is again actually uh, Hadzor. You remember the the Northern Alliance, the king that was destroyed. So you have now a king there, uh, and he has a general called Sisera. And so she calls upon Barak, but Barak doesn't trust in the Lord. And he's like, you know, you need to come with me if I need to go into battle. And she says, well, because of that, uh, you will not be the one who destroys uh, the general. But, uh, you know, it will be a woman who kills him. And sure enough, the, the battle goes on well uh, in the northern plains of Jezreel. And uh, the enemy is destroyed. But when Sisera escapes, he goes into the uh, tent of this woman uh, and uh, she says, you know, come in, I'll hide you. And then while he is uh, sleeping, uh, she uh, kills him with a tent peg uh, to his head. And so that's the next judge that we see. And then you have the Gideon narrative. And that's kind of like the pinnacle of this whole thing. This time the enemies are the Midianites. And each of these, I want you to remember, there is a sin cycle. The people sin. God brings these um, uh, nations around them to attack. And then the people are crying out for help, and then God raises up a judge. And this time, the nation is Midian. If you remember, Midian is in the southern part uh, where Moses went to with his, where he got married, and like, he came back. So the Midianites have come up, and um, they are attacking. And Gideon, actually, the narrative opens with a very interesting case. He is actually threshing his wheat. Uh, in what is like a wine press. He's, he's afraid that anybody might watch him thresh his wheat and then take that away from him, the Midianites. And so he's kind of doing it in secret. He is not the most courageous guy. But God sends his angel and calls him a bold warrior because God was going to make him one. And then you have the Gideon and the fleece. Once again, uh, a demonstration of Gideon's mistrust or distrust of God. Uh, that he did not have the faith that it took to trust God for his word. Uh, but God still is gracious to Gideon and uh, does this uh, fleece uh, thing. And then um, Gideon then takes the, uh, actually first he has to deal with sin within the uh, town as the people are worshipping this uh, Asherah poles. He has to, he destroys that. And then finally he calls, rallies the people and goes out into war. And then uh, you know the narrative where 
um, God says, you know, there's just too many people. Um, so those who didn't want to fight could go back, 10,000 people leave. And then you have the people that are separated when they drink the water by the brook and those who lap versus those who use their hands. And ultimately, you have only 300 men that go with Gideon. And uh, the night before the battle, God actually tells Gideon, you know, if you're afraid, you know, take your servant and go listen to what's going on in the enemy camp. And that's where it, Gideon realizes, just not very differently than when Joshua brought the people into, uh, before the attack of Jericho, the people uh, were actually afraid. There was visions that God was giving them and terrifying them of what was going to happen. And um, um, so Gideon knows that the Lord has intended for this to happen. And so he comes back, he has a plan. Uh, he, uh, they don't have swords and shields. Rather, they have this, um, um, this torch and uh, this uh, horn, a ram's horn, which is like a trumpet. And they have this um, um, torch under a jar. And so they surround the, peop uh, the army, uh, the enemies, and then they break the jar, raise the torch, and then they blow this horn. Um, and uh, what the Lord does there is these men did not use their weapons to fight, but the Lord throws the enemy into confusion and they destroy one another uh, in, the, in, the, in the night as they leave. And the work that is left for Gideon is just a cleanup, uh, taking the provisions that are left behind. Uh, the next uh, judge you have is Abimelech. Right at the very end of, uh, in Genesis uh, 8, you see, uh, I'm sorry, in Judges 8, Gideon actually says <clears throat> the people want to make him king, but uh, Gideon reminds them that God is their king and he would not be their king. And uh, But at the same time, he asks them for their gold and makes this uh, ephod that they raise. Uh, in his mind, probably to remind the people of the worship of God, but that soon becomes a snare and then people um, worship it as an idol. But the son of Gideon, uh, his name is Abimelech. And again, we don't know if this was the na his name as Gideon named it or whether it, he changed his name. Because while Gideon said that um, he will not rule as king, the name Abimelech means um, son of a king. So Ab Abba is father, Abi is son of. And Melek, as you know, is king. So here you have um, uh, the son of Gideon calling himself the son of the king and kills all his other. He's a very wicked person who kills the other sons. And then uh, he wants to now be the oppressor ruling over the various towns. And as he, as he um, surrounds one of these towns and uh, there is a, a woman who throws um, a um, the grinding instrument, the motor, and from from the top, and then it hits his head, and he dies. Uh, he uh, and so you have somewhat of a similarity between the Deborah Barak narrative and uh, the Abimelech case, where he is actually killed by a woman. And then you have uh, Jephthah, and Jephthah is also a social outcast. Uh, he because uh, he is not the son of the uh, wife, but uh, so the sons. Uh, his father's, uh, his half-brothers cast him out. Uh, but then when you have um, uh, enemies attacking the land, they call upon Jephthah because uh, they want uh, his help to fight against uh, the enemy. And so Jephthah, uh, he... This is with the Ammonites. So once again, on the east of the Jordan, you remember you have the... Uh, Moabites and the Ammonites, Moab and Ammon being the sons of uh, gra grandsons or the sons of Lot. Um, and uh, the Ammonites had come here and now Jephthah is called. And uh, uh, Jephthah agrees uh, to fight and then he does. The Lord uses him as a judge to deliver them, uh, deliver Israel from the Ammonites. And uh, there is one interesting narrative in the life of Jephthah, which is, Right at the very end, he, he is so elated with the work of God that he uh, promises to, to give uh, whatever comes out of his house um, as an offering to the Lord. And what happens to come is actually his uh, daughter. And, um, and so uh, commentators differ on what exactly he did um, because his offering was supposed to be a burnt offering. And such an offering is not 
um, anywhere um, prescribed in the in the Bible, and God does not uh, require such a such an offering. So either Jephthah foolishly uh, did offer his child as a burnt offering, or um, some of the other commentators go the other way and say that you know he she was devoted to the Lord and not she wasn't killed um, as a as a sacrifice. But uh, that's the Jephthah narrative. And then finally you have Samson. And once again, you know, um, this is probably one of the judges that you have the most detail upon. Um, here you have a son that is born in old age, um, uh, called, chosen, and yet a profligate and a complete scoundrel in the human sense of the term. And uh, as you follow the Samson narrative, you can see how through the sinfulness of Samson and the way he wanted a Philistine girl, the way in which he deals with those um, um, townsfolk of the Philistines, that his own sinfulness becomes the occasion of provocation as the Lord uh, brings judgment upon the Philistines. And then um, uh, actually one of one of my professors used to say, Samson doesn't seem like the kind of guy that was like He-Man with a lot of muscles. He was probably like an average looking guy who had this supernatural looking strength. And uh, that just blows the people away when they see the kind of things that he does. And uh, and I think, you know, uh, when we think of all of these judges, uh, once again, it is just a reminder that it is nothing in each of these men that makes them uh, special in God's eyes. But it is God who chooses and sanctifies and equips these men to do what he has called them to do. And once again, it is all of grace. It is not by works. And then finally, you have the epilogue of judges. And uh, here you have two. And um, we're going to look at the epilogue in a little more detail. So if you had to ask the question, what is the main argument of the book of Judges? You know, many of you are probably familiar with this. And uh, this is the verse, Judges 17.6. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Uh, on the one hand, it seems kind of nice that every man did what was right. <coughs> he wasn't willfully doing what was wrong. But what was right in his own eyes was the opposite of what was right in God's eyes. There was no uh, leader that brought them back to God. And each man was his own king and did what was sinful, but in his, in his eyes, pleasurable and right. So we're going to look at these two events very quickly. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. The first one is in the chapter 17. Here you have a Levite. Uh, from the town of Bethlehem, who becomes a priest to the people of Dan. So uh, I think I have a map here. Okay. Um, I don't think I have a map. So what happens here is, in the first case, you have a Levite who, um, instead of serving with the people of um, um, uh, uh, in the tabernacle, uh, along with the um, uh, with the worship that should be done there, he, this man actually goes and becomes a priest. He's kind of getting an elevation in position uh, to not the people of Dan, actually to the to a person, uh, to a rich man in the hill country of Ephraim. And as he uh, serves this uh, man, because he is um, uh, he, he's got his job secure. The people of some of the people of Dan come by and then they steal from this rich man and they also take the Levite and they actually move their inheritance. Actually, if you look at your uh, 12 tribes of uh, Dan, uh, I'm sorry, 12 tribes of Israel, Dan is actually below Ephraim, you know, above Judah to the to the west. But uh, these people actually move from there all the way to the uh, northernmost tip. So if you look at the northernmost tip, you have another dam there. And that's because these people actually moved and settled uh, in the northern tip. And they would be the ones that will face, uh, once again, the uh, enemy each time that happens uh, because they simply do move from there. But here, just by show of force, again, might is right in this case. They, they steal the Levite, they steal the idols of this man, and then they go up and settle in the north. Just a, just a kind of... Um, um, I don't know, I've seen this. Eh, never mind. I'll skip that example I had. Now the next one you have is um, a much more horrific one, which is in um, Judges 19. 
here you have a concubine once again from the town of Bethlehem who is murdered in Gibeah and I want you to notice the name Gibeah we're going to come back to that um, later today and it sparks off a war against the tribe of Benjamin so here let's look at the map that we have here so what you have here is um, uh, you have a Bethlehem and this man uh, he has a concubine uh, with whom he has some uh, uh, maybe a fight so she goes back to her hometown of Bethlehem he goes to uh, uh, bring her back home uh, and on the way um, uh, the father the father-in-law he restrains them with hospitality and then finally he says I need to go so as they're leaving they go past Jebus or uh, you know the Jebusites which is Jerusalem but they don't stop there because this is still a pagan town so they want to go to Gibeah uh, which is um, um, belonging to the type of Benjamin so under the assumption that those who are of their uh, own nation would be more righteous and safe but when they actually do come there they find that this place is just like Sodom and Gomorrah uh, there's someone who shows them hospitality he tells them this is a dangerous place don't stay in the uh, in the in the town center and um, uh, as you know these men come looking for uh, the man and uh, the man um, with no um, um, it, I don't know it, no shame is what comes to my mind but he just gives his concubine and then uh, she is uh, abused all night and then she is murdered at the end and then he ends up uh, uh, cutting her up her body and then sending it out to the different 12 uh, to the other tribes and uh, saying that this has been a horrific crime that has happened and even in this a debauched uh, time of the judges the people are wakened up by this horrific crime and they all come to fight against um, um, Benjamin and uh, let me say a few more words here so what happens is this town of Gibeah is what has committed the crime and the tribe of Benjamin allies with the Gibeon, Gibeah the people of Gibeah and saying that you cannot uh, uh, um, fight against Gibeah we will fight with them and the, the tribe of Benjamin even though small are very strong warriors and you see this uh, series of battles uh, where uh, Benjamin fights against the rest of the tribes and finally you have uh, the uh, people of Benjamin um, uh, vanquished and they become a very small tribe after this and in fact Gibeah would be a very small place and also possibly the object of the hatred of the other nations or other tribes around them so you these two events should kind of give you a example or a state of the land as it were if you if you think that you know how things were in Canaan before the Israelites came uh, and the and the idolatry and the perversity and then now you have the Israelites come over and take the land and you have the sin cycle back and forth and this is the kind of sin that was prevalent and it is in this context that you come to the next book which is the book of Ruth and uh, Ruth and Naomi they will return again to Bethlehem so you can see this pattern of Bethlehem um, over here you know the events that are happening and they will come to Bethlehem and there Ruth will have uh, uh, will have a child who is the grandfather of David So with that we come to the book of Ruth and I think it you know on the one sense we know that uh, uh, let, let's maybe start here so first we have uh, Naomi's bitterness and this is the first chapter you have Naomi and her husband and her two sons there's a famine in the land and they go out uh, to Moab as you know across the Jordan and down south is Moab and they go there and they're staying there uh, the sons get married to the local Moabite women once again something prohibited by God and then uh, God uh, Naomi's husband, Naomi means pleasant, her husband dies, her sons die and then the two daughter-in-laws Naomi says you know you go back I cannot provide for you and then one of the daughter-in-laws leaves the other one Ruth uh, says that uh, I will be with you uh, your God shall be my God and so she allies herself she is one of those what we would call a convert who trusts in the God of Israel and I, I know most of you are very familiar with this Pastor Mike just preached through this so I'm going to go quickly but if there's questions please please feel free to stop um, so when Naomi comes back uh, to Bethlehem um, she the people recognize her 
uh, and uh, she calls, she says, call me Mara or bitter because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. And she still does not know the sovereign hand of God in her life. And then uh, Ruth is the one who provides for Naomi and she goes and um, um, gleans in the fields um, as, as one who is a widow. Um, this is a provision that you have in the Pentateuch that the people who had the fields would have to leave their um, edges from being harvested. And so uh, she brings us food, but Boaz watches her and he is kind toward her. And then, uh, and soon uh, that progresses, as you know, Naomi asks Ruth to meet with uh, Boaz and she meets him in the night and uh, Boaz says, you know, you have uh, trusted in our God and um, you have shown kindness and I will take care of you. And then um, uh, because Boaz is not the first in line as a kinsman, and so he then goes and um, uh, uh, meets with the actual person who is the closest uh, in line and then says, uh, Naomi is back. Do you want to uh, uh, take her land? And and uh, the kinsman redeemer is fine until he finds out that he needs to marry Ruth and provide for her line and her lineage. And at that point, he, <coughs> he backs off and then Boaz, in front of all the townspeople, gets his uh, slipper uh, to show that he has acquired the right to be a kinsman redeemer. And uh, and uh, then you have Naomi having the baby in her hand and then uh, providing the blessing. And she would, um, Ruth would now be in the, uh, Moabitess would now be in the lineage of King David and ultimately of Jesus Christ. <coughs> and in this book, once again, you see Boaz as a type of Christ, as the one who redeems um, Ruth and her line. All right, so let me stop here. Let me take a few questions. We, we finished Judges and Ruth. Uh, Ruth as being one of those um, uh, transitions between the end of the book of Judges uh, into the time of the kings. As you know, Ruth is the... Uh, David would be born from her line. So let me stop here. Any questions, comments, thoughts? I'm good. Everything sounded good to me. All right. Um, and again, if you have questions, you know, please write them down. I didn't get any questions from last week. Let's email me or you can put it on the on the Moodle and then I, I'll answer them for you. All right. So let's keep moving. Uh, so now we come to the books of First and Second Samuel. And... Um, um, so who is Samuel? As the book of 1 Samuel opens up, uh, he is this uh, promised child uh, to Hannah. And uh, this is a time when Eli, the judge, is one of the judges, is the judge, uh, and he is a priest as well. And Samuel is a, is a, uh, is a, is a child given to Hannah uh, by God's promise. And so, uh, and he, he would be a prophet uh, that is speaking for God to the people of God. And having been adopted into Eli's line, he would also be serving as the priest in the um, before the ark. So here you have uh, the events that surround the ark of the covenant. And once again, as the book of First Samuel opens, you can just see this um, moral decay from the book of Judges carrying over. You have Eli, who is uh, the priest. Uh, his sons are, are, are wicked men, and um, uh, Eli doesn't do anything to um, watch over how the sacrifices must be made as these men profane the sacrifices to God. And then God brings a judgment for the Philistines. And then um, the people, the Israelites now think of the ark as a, a good luck charm. You know, if I just take the ark into battle, God will somehow be with us and he would destroy the enemies as he has done before. Uh, just as how... When Joshua crossed over the River Jordan with the ark, you know, the river stopped and the, and the Jericho fell. And so they have these thoughts that uh, God was just some kind of a genie to help them with his ark rather than a holy God that demanded their full allegiance. So they go with the ark and uh, what happens is uh, they are des destroyed by um uh, by the Philistines. And so you have uh, the sons of uh, uh, Eli killed, 
uh, Eli himself falls over and dies, and now Samuel is the judge who is now in rule, while the ark is actually in enemy territory. In fact, you have a few events that surround it. So if you're in the book of 1 Samuel, you can just see what happens when the ark is in, uh, in the temple of Dagon, and the, and the temple and the... Um, and the and the idol basically falls down and breaks as it's um, placed in the presence of this ark. And so the uh, Philistines kind of figure out that this is not a good thing for them to have because God is afflicting them. And so they uh, f figure out a fashion in which they make a cart and then send this ark back into Israel. So the ark does come back into Israel at the time of Samuel. Now. With Samuel, Samuel is the last of the judges, and he will anoint Saul to be the first of the king. And uh, it's very interesting that uh, Saul is kind of the reluctant king. He doesn't really want to be a king, but God calls him to be one. He comes from the tribe of Benjamin and the city of Judah, and he will be anointed as king. And as you can remember, uh, Gibeah is that town that where you had that event. Uh, where all the people were destroyed. And uh, you have a few other events that surround it in terms of the few men that remained and uh, having wives for them. And so here you have a very small tribe, a tribe which was probably facing the hatred of, of the Israelites. And out of that, God picks Saul. Now Saul was uh, physically head and shoulders above everybody else, but he was not really the uh, charismatic guy. And uh, But when God picks him and anoints him, you, you hear the Spirit of God come upon him and then he now is empowered in a way that is unusual. Right at the time when he becomes a king, um, there is opposition as people say, Who's, who made you king over us? And Saul is not the kind of guy to um, stand up and, um, and uh, fight for his own rights. Uh, in, when we think of the a king, we think of someone who's ruling in a palace, but if you, when, when we read the first Samuel, we see that he was, he continues to go back and plow his oxen. He is not, um, the next time we see uh, Saul, he is still doing whatever he was doing before, and it is only later in the life that you see that the kingly um, retinue and the, and the glamour comes up as the prestige builds up. Because until now, Saul hasn't done anything. One thing that happens uh, here, let me, uh, yeah, if you are in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 11, you have the Ammonites come and take Jabesh Gilead. So here you have a very strange uh, case where the people of Jabesh Gilead submit to Ammon, uh, to the Ammonites, and uh, but the Ammonites would, uh, would say that they take off the right eye of every man and the Jabesh Gilead people say, well, in that case, let's see if we can get some help. So they send word for uh, all the town of Israel, and uh, one of them come to Gibeah. Um, Saul hears it, and then he um, takes his yoke and uh, uh, breaks it into 12 pieces, sends one to each of the tribes and says, you know, um, you, with a rally to uh, arms, saying, you know, we need to fight, and uh, he he sacrifices his, his cattle, and then you have a, a mighty victory as Saul defeats the Ammonites. And at this point, actually I have the text here, he took a yoke of oxen, cut them in pieces, sent them throughout the territory of Israel by hand of messengers, saying, whoever does not come out after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. It's a, it's a, it's a threat, and at the same time it was a rallying cry. In some ways similar to the earlier, earlier time when out of Gibeah you had this woman's body that was sent out, but uh, this time for a good purpose in order to uh, defend uh, their fellow Israelite people. Um, all right, so let me stop here for a minute. So what happens here is uh, Saul rises in prestige in the eyes of the people. So even those who were opposed to him earlier, they see the hand of God uh, through Saul uh, as a king, uh, bringing them, um, uh, uh, bringing them uh, deliverance from the enemy. Uh, I need to back up here a little bit because the reason 
Samuel goes for Saul is that the people ask for a king. In fact, I've been reading the various uh, books on this uh, subject of king, whether you should or shouldn't have a king. We have references to the king in the Pentateuch. And uh, the problem, the sinfulness of asking for a king was that the people at this time, as they are dis as uh, Eli dies and uh, Philistines take over, the people were looking for a king like the nations around them. They saw the nations around them strong because of a leader that was uh, taking care of them. And um, they wanted a king like that rather than trusting in God for a leader like they had earlier with Moses and with Joshua and so forth. And uh, so there is a sinfulness in the request for a king, but God still graciously provides for it. And in fact, um, he will soon provide for uh, a line from which you will have a king who will rule forever. So if you now uh, look at uh, We skip through a few things here. Um, I'm going to skip through a few things. We'll come back and look at them in a in a slide a little later. So here in uh, um, First Samuel 15, uh, we have Samuel speaking uh, to 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 Saul. This is Samuel as the prophet speaking to Saul and giving him a charge. God has asked him to do something. So he reminds him first, the Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. God is telling you something you need to do. And uh, I can't read this. Okay, I'll just look at it from here. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. So here... Um, when, when uh, Moses brought the people of Israel uh, up unto the promised land, the Amalekites had opposed them, and God is judging them through Saul and the Israelites. And, uh, and so he says, uh, now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction. Now that word devote to destruction or utterly destroy, this is the term that, I, that we used earlier when we looked at the town of uh, Jericho, which is harem or... Um, um, the ban that everything should be destroyed and uh, do not spare him but put to death both man and woman child and infant ox and sheep camel and donkey basically everything that's living needs to be uh, under the ban or completely destroyed and Saul once again empowered by God defeats the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur which is east of Egypt and he captured Agag the king of the Amalekites alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So, so far he has done what is right. He has uh, captured Agag, and Agag, we will see uh, next week, um, um, one of his descendants um, that is an enemy of Israel. But in verse 9, Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the factlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. So here you see, um, uh, as a nation fighting an enemy nation, uh, they actually destroyed them, all except for Agag. And then when it came to the possessions, just like uh, Achan did with trying to uh, take the bar of gold and, uh, and the clothes, he, the, these men looked at what was good and said, these we will keep, but whatever was despised and worthless, those we will destroy under the ban as if those who are dedicated to the Lord, but these are for us. And then uh, when he is caught, he basically says, well, these are, um, he, he, you have excuses from Saul on behalf of the people. In fact, one of the character traits of Saul is that he is afraid of the people around him rather than a leader who was uh, seeking to please the Lord. In fact, two times when he offends, both the times it is big, partly because of fear of the Lord and just his character in terms of trusting in God. And so here you have in uh, 1522, Samuel says, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. And the idea being, if God ordains the path 
um, for you, uh, you don't have a better way uh, that you come up with. You need to trust God and do what he says. But rebellion is at the sin of divination. And as we see the end of the life of Saul, he would stoop down as low as that. And insubordination as iniquity and idolatry. And um, because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Now, um, I think this is kind of important just to let this word sink in for a little bit. Rebellion and insubordination on the one hand, divination, iniquity and idolatry on the other. Uh, normally when we think of sin, we always think of the um, deeds of sin that are heinous uh, that we shudder from. But it, uh, right here in the Old Testament, you see how sin is actually a heart issue. It has to do with whether we trust in God or whether we rebel against God, whether we'll bow down to his ways or whether we will say, no, I want to do things my way, and I think I can do things that will please God on my own. And um, um, and that is a challenge for each of us today as well in our sanctification. It's not just the deeds of iniquity, but rather where our heart is. God has saved me. Do I love him? Do I um, uh, delight in him? Do I want to please him with all that I think, all that I say, all that I meditate upon? And uh, the consequence here for Saul is uh, huge. Uh, from being a nobody, God made him uh, the king, and now God takes him away from being the king uh, because he is not right with God. And then you have this passage here, and this is something I learned new from John Stevenson. So here in uh, verses 27 and 28, we read, As Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. And now from, from this point, this is the first incident where you have the tearing of the robe. And you will see similar tearing of the robe in various uh, events. We'll see some today and some next week. And you will see how this um, tearing of the robe symbolizes the division of the kingdom. And... Um, and actually, the edge of the robe is, well, well, I'll, I'll talk about the edge of the robe later. But uh, here, um, Samuel uses it as an object lesson to say that uh, the kingdom will be given to your neighbor. Uh, so Samuel said to him, the Lord has stolen the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. And uh, soon after, in uh, chapter 16, you have uh, God tell Samuel to go and anoint David uh, as the uh, next future king of Israel. Now again, as you know, the story of the anointing itself, he goes and meets with Jesse. And Jesse brings his sons. All the sons come, but God doesn't pick any of them. And then finally, there's one son who's in the fields. And when this young boy comes, God picks him up. And he says, you know, God does not see as man sees. He sees the heart. And David is going to be kind of opposite uh, character and stature compared to Saul. Saul is a tall guy, but he was a man who was pleasing the men around him. And David would be a man who was after God's own heart, uh, even though he was a young and ready boy. And then you have the Goliath narrative um, in uh, chapter 17. So here you have uh, the Philistines once again attack. So Goliath uh, is one of their chief men, a giant. Uh, and he uh, stands up and defies the armies of Israel saying, you know, one-to-one -one combat, whoever f defeats me, whoever wins will, will win the war. And um, no man is uh, brave enough to face him. And as we remember, Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else, but Saul is terrified of this man. And actually, at the point of the anointing in the previous uh, chapter, you have the Spirit of God depart from Saul and come upon David. And you have a kind of courage and bravery as you read uh, this narrative. It just um, uh, evokes in you uh, an, an awe of the kind of um, faith that David has, where uh, here is this Philistine who's, who's terrifying from a human perspective, but as a, from a spiritual perspective, he has uh, offended God by uh, defying the armies of the living God. And so David stands in the name of God. He doesn't rely upon the traditional um, armor or weaponry, 
Uh, he picks this uh, sling with which he is very skilled. He has used it in fighting the wild animals. And in fact, um, this is not just a toy. Uh, we normally think of this as a toy, but it is actually a weaponry. In fact, uh, some of uh, David's soldiers in the future, uh, you will read they had the extreme skill with this in battle. So this is like infantry. And so he uses uh, uh, the weapon of his choice, but he makes it very clear so when Goliath comes down, it is because of the Lord uh, that he was delivered unto him. And so you have the Philistines uh, destroyed in this plane. So you have a picture of the plane where this occurred. Uh, so you have, I, I, I just love this uh, language. You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. And uh, I'm sure some... Some of you can remember those times in your life. Maybe you haven't said this out loud, but when there is a trial where there's really no human uh, response, but God just supernaturally gives you the strength and the courage to stand for what he has called you to, uh, you know that the Lord of hosts is behind you, and you there is really nothing that can go wrong, not in terms of the physical battle, but in terms of what he has called you, he will enable you to finish. And um, just another small point here, the Philistines here, have um, have the latest iron weaponry. Um, uh, so they, they have uh, skill with making iron uh, implements and, uh, and weapons of war. And uh, so he comes with all of these latest uh, tools and, uh, not tools, weapons. Uh, but um, David's reliance is not upon the uh, latest technology, but rather upon the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts, the word host talks about the hosts of heaven, which are the angels, and he is the God who the Philistine has taunted. All right, so with this, uh, we are going to look at a quick summary as we move through First Samuel. So you have, <clears throat> in chapter 16, with the anointing, you have David given the Spirit of God. So once again, if you remember, the word anointing, um, the Messiah is the anointed one, and that's the same word for Christ. So uh, as David is anointed with this oil, symbolically showing the presence of God, he is also given the spirit of God upon him. And at the same time, you have Saul, uh, this God's spirit, depart from Saul, and he give, he's given an evil spirit. And actually between 16 and 17, you actually have a case where David is in Saul's service uh, because David, Saul is in um, tormented, and so David comes and sings to him. But Saul does not recognize him later in 17 when he comes back again uh, to fight David and Goliath. Once again, in chapter 17, David faces Goliath in faith and as victory. Saul fears Goliath. And then in chapter 18, now that Goliath is uh, defeated, um, David is loved by others, uh, even those of Saul's family, which would be uh, Jonathan and um, Michal, who marries him. Um, and in fact, here you have the songs that become very popular. Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed his ten thousands, even though he has just defeated uh, one major giant. Um, and so now Saul, as he hears this, now is jealous of David and wants to murder him. And he would uh, have a series of attempts at taking his life. So here we have the first instance in chapter 19. Now uh, you can actually skim with this. So you have Saul trying to kill uh, David, but at, uh, at this time his wife and the daughter of Saul uh, assist David to escape by um, uh, uh, letting him out the window and then uh, having a dummy in his place. And uh, the, the, David is assisted by the Lord in escaping. And then secondly, uh, in chapter 20, David and Jonathan, they make a covenant. They are real solid friends, and they Jonathan watches out for uh, David. And David is actually assisted by Abimelech, the priest, uh, when he actually flees from David um, uh, this time. And in this particular case, he is the priest who doesn't know that David is being targeted by Saul. And so Abimelech will pray for it. Uh, with his uh, with his with his life, um, Doeg the Edomite would watch Abimelech help David, and then he would uh, tell Saul, and Saul would be ruthless in killing all the priests. 
uh, assuming that there is some kind of a coup that is going on on the site. And you can just see the fear of man in Saul just develop uh, exponentially. Uh, you can almost think of him as a as a um, as one who is divided in his mind, and when these terrors come upon him, he does things that are practically insane. And then finally, in uh, in uh, Exodus, I'm um, sorry, First Samuel 21, David actually free, ends up fleeing to Gath, which is the town of Goliath. And so here he is with the Philistines for a for a time, acting like a madman. And for a moment, David loses his mind as well. Here he is uh, in the land of the Philistines seen as an enemy of the king of Israel and therefore not their enemy. Uh, but he acts as a madman because of his fear of the Philistines. And then he leaves from there to uh, Moab and there he leaves his parents. And actually Moab, David does have some ties with Moab. If you remember, his great great grandmother is uh, Ruth who comes from Moab. And uh, so Moab, the king of Moab again sees David as an enemy of the king of Israel. And so he doesn't um, um, destroy him. And then chapters 22, 24, and 26, you have Saul pursuing um, David uh, three times in the first pursuit. Uh, David is encouraged by Jonathan and assisted by the Lord in the second pursuit. You have this event where uh, David is, uh, Saul is actually um, in this cave where David and his men are hiding. He doesn't know it. And uh, he is uh, well, he's relieving himself. David is up there and cuts a piece of Saul's robe. This is the second time we're talking about the cutting of the robe. We remember earlier with Saul and um, Samuel, where Saul tore Samuel's robe, and that's when the kingdom was going to be uh, divided. And um, so David actually writes a psalm in this um, based on his time here. So Psalm 57.1 for the choir director said to Al Tashet, a victim of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave, Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. You can just imagine this. Here is David with his men, a band of guys, while Saul and his entire army is outside. And um, Saul has bent on killing David. Well, David has made a vow never to touch the hand, uh, hair on the head of Saul because he is the Lord's anointed. And so uh, this psalm just gives you a picture of the trust that David had in, in God while destruction was right there uh, before him. And so he says, under the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. And again, using the language here, um, uh, John Stevenson talks about the shadow of your wings. Uh, so the edge of the robe is called wings. And uh, so just as he cuts the edge of uh, Saul's robe, uh, his reflection is upon the robe of God that is covering him. And, um, and then again, at that point, he reminds Saul once again, I could have killed you, but I didn't. And uh, each time David confronts Saul, Saul will repent. Uh, but only for a time until he comes back again. And then you have the event of David, Abigail, and um, Nabal. Uh, so here, the wealthy man uh, who has this sheep that David and his men took care of, uh, but then he foolishly um, refuses to take care of David, and then uh, David comes to kill Nabal, and then Abigail um, forestalls that uh, with her wisdom, and then Nabal uh, is struck by the Lord, and and then David ends up marrying Abigail. And that's one of the traits of David, which we will see, uh, the sins that he uh, will pay for uh, in his own family. Uh, but then coming back to the third pursuit, uh, this time David takes Saul's spear and jug and then shows him once again that he could have killed him whilst he was sleeping, the spear by his side. Uh, and then Saul once again um, uh, repents for a season. And, uh, and then returns. But uh, in the end of that event, you have David assisted by the Philistines. This time he goes, um, and uh, you have in chapter 27, uh, to Ashish, who's one of the five kings of the Philistines. So you have five Philistine lords. David goes there and then says, uh, 
may I stay in one of your cities? And he gives him Ziglag. And so he stays in the town of Ziglag. And uh, David is kind of like a, a covert or maybe a double agent. He, he, he needs protection from Saul. He pretends to be in the favor of the Philistines while he actually ends up raiding uh, all the enemies of Israel. And um, actually, John Stevenson makes a point that it's possible that he learns some of their technology while he is here because the Philistines had all these uh, iron making um, skills that they use for their weaponry. And uh, after David comes back from the Philistines, now the nation of Israel will have uh, equipment as well. And it's, a, it's quite possible that David might have learned these things when he came back from there. But for a year and four months, uh, David stays in Ziglag. And again, you have those events around that, uh, including when he tries to fight in battle, he's sent back, and then uh, his people are, um, his families are kidnapped, and then God helps him rescue them as well. So this is a picture of Ziglag. And uh, okay, so this is the battle I kind of already talked about this. So the Philippines now are going to fight against Israel, and uh, all of them come uh, by the way of the Philistines uh, along the highway to the north side uh, to fight, and uh, in the town of uh, in around uh, Shunem. So the Philistines are camped uh, are camped over here, while um, Saul gathered all the army and camped on Gilboa, so Mount Gilboa. So these are the two locations. So you can see the mount in the background. You see the plains where the battles can be fought. And this is the so this is how the armies are arrayed against each other. So David, as you know, has been excused already from the battle. The Philistines don't want uh, David uh, in their side and turn um, uh, turn and attack them in the middle of the battle. Now. Uh, Saul, as you know, the Spirit of God has already left him. He doesn't have Samuel anymore because Samuel is dead. And so he, who had been instrumental in implementing the law of God in the land, where he put away with all the um, mediums and witches in the land, he now wants guidance and he wants to do it uh, using divination, the very thing that he himself destroyed. So he goes uh, by night to uh, Endor, and uh, he has to kind of go past the Philistines, but in the night he sneaks past uh, to this uh, to this witch, um, and uh, she, after uh, convincing her that no harm will come to her, she does something, and she um, will read the passage in chapter 28, verses 11 to 12. Then the woman said, "Whom shall I bring up for you?" And he said, "Bring up Samuel for me." When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me, for you are Saul? And the king said to her, Don't be afraid, what do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a divine being, and the term used there is Elohim, and uh, could be like God or with a small g, or a spirit coming up out of the earth. And he said to her, What is his form? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he's wrapped with a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground. Homage. All right, let me just stop here for a moment. And actually, let's not. We'll, we'll evaluate this uh, in a minute. So then you have verses 18 and 19, as you, and this is um, uh, the spirit, so-called Samuel, speaking to Saul. As you did not obey the Lord and did not execute his fierce wrath of Amalek, so the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will also give over Israel along with you into the hands of the Philistines. Therefore, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Indeed, the Lord will give over the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Thus Saul died with his three sons, his armor bearer, and all his men on that day together. Um, let, me, let me go back here for a minute. So here you have this very strange event where there is a witchcraft and you have a spirit uh, that seems to come up from the depths of the earth and then um, recognized by Saul as Samuel. Um, now, some commentators seem to think that, you know, because Saul recognizes the spirit as Samuel, this is what it is, that it is actually the spirit 
of Samuel that came up from the ground. And then um, other commentators would go, uh, actually John Stevenson actually also prescribes to that view that this is probably Samuel, the spirit of Samuel sent to give one final judgment to Saul before he dies in battle. And then um, there are others who don't see this as, um, as Samuel, but rather as an evil spirit that just comes up and disguises itself as Samuel and um, um, gives a prophecy which is actually pretty true uh, in this particular case because everyone does die. But um, they, uh, some would see that as a self-fulfilling prophecy where the strength in Saul leaves when he knows that this is what is going to happen. And um, and you, uh, so whatever the reason is, so those are the two ways views of looking at it. I personally don't think this is um, Samuel, but rather an evil spirit. But uh, what happens here is in the battle, uh, Saul, Jonathan, um, and some of his sons die, not all of them. And um, Saul is actually wounded in battle, and then he uh, asks for his armor bearer to kill him because the Philistines would mutilate the body and then um, and play with the with the king and uh, the armor bearer refuses and then Saul falls on his own sword and and ends up dying That's basically the end of Saul so here if you had to look at um, Saul in three acts as it is broken down in the very beginning Saul meets Samuel and is anointed by him in fact the very uh, manner in which he meets it's also probably his uh, sheep are lost, he goes looking for it and he meets Samuel, God anoints him. And then he has success in the battle, you remember the Ammonites, with the help of God. And then you have a failure, we didn't touch upon this failure with Samuel, where Saul is waiting for, uh, Saul and the soldiers are there to make a uh, sacrifice and Samuel is delayed and then Saul does not wait for Samuel, that's the first failure. And then there is another failure with Jonathan where uh, while fighting the Philistines, Saul makes a foolish vow that no one should eat anything and uh, curses the one who would eat and that they would be put to death. And uh, what happens is Jonathan is unaware of this and God uses Jonathan, in fact, to breach the uh, fight and then uh, gain a victory over the Philistines. And so when Saul wants to kill Jonathan to fulfill his foolish vow, the men stand up against him and then he has to back up. So that's another failure in the life of Saul. And then we saw 15 <coughs> uh, with Agag where Saul failed to do what God had asked him uh, to put under the ban everything but rather uh, the men kept the fat uh, cattle for themselves. And then you have uh, a success in battle with the help of David. This is with the Philistines where Goliath is defeated. And then uh, Saul fails both David and Jonathan. So uh, Saul turns into this uh, mad rage against David to kill him because he sees him as a threat to the throne. And he's so foolish that he's, he would even want to kill Jonathan because of Jonathan allying himself with David. And then finally you have chapter 28 where Saul meets quote-unquote Samuel and his death is foretold. And then he is defeated in battle and commits suicide. All right, let's uh, stop here for a minute um, before we move to the next section. Any questions? We've covered quite a bit between Samuel and Saul and things before this. Uh, I'll take a few questions if there are any, and then we'll move to David. Um, Pradeep, I had a question regarding Saul. Um, mm -hmm. So um, we know that Saul was anointed by God to be king. So um, I'm trying to draw a difference between um, being anointed by God for a particular purpose versus uh, being saved. I mean, I'm, I'm almost certain that Saul did not die a saved man. Um, but how does that relate to uh, being anointed by God as a king? Excellent question. Um, let me give you a few points and uh, hopefully I'll be able to answer your question too. So firstly, there is a difference in the manner in which the Holy Spirit is given to us in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. 
in the New Testament, believers, the moment we trust in Christ, when we are regenerated, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So every believer has the indwelling of the Holy Spirit the moment we become a believer. And that's not what you see until the Holy Spirit is given to us in Acts 2. So pre-Acts 2, all of Old Testament, you don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, we have what we call the filling of the Holy Spirit. So you constantly have, like in Ephesians, Ephesians 5, in Acts 3, Acts 5, you see that the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit, and we must be filled with the Holy Spirit. So there are times in which by studying in the Word and relying upon the Lord, we can also be filled with the Holy Spirit, kind of like how David was filled with the Holy Spirit when he went out and fought Goliath. Um, so there is this filling of the Holy Spirit that is common in both the Old and the New Testament. But the indwelling is something that is only that is unique to New Testament believers, not to the Old Testament. Now, that said, um, so you have in the case of Saul, and we're going to see soon in the case of David, David is going to be anointed in a very unique, uh, and the promise that is going to be given to him is very different than what is given to Saul. In, in David, there is a promise to him and his descendants forever um, in terms of being king um, under God. And so, you know, through Jesus, this will be fulfilled in David's case. Whereas for Saul, that was not a promise that was given to him. So he was um, given the anointing uh, to accomplish a task, and then it it appears to be a conditional one where it was taken away uh, when he disobeyed. Now, the question that you actually kind of, you had a few things in your question. In terms of Saul, is he a believer or not? Um, I tended to to lean more towards what you said, which is, you know, based on how his life just um, catapults down, it seemed like he's not a believer. Uh, but I did read someone who implied that he was just, he was probably saved, uh, but didn't live a life that was honoring to God, especially toward the end. Now, um, I haven't studied this more closely, but that's a good question to consider, you know, where exactly Saul was with regards to the Holy Spirit. But uh, Suresh, uh, can you maybe bring up your question again? I'm sure I missed parts of it and I responded to you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've actually answered uh, my question uh, uh, the uh, host of it. So I, I just had another question regarding the answer that you gave. So uh, can you differentiate between the, Indi uh, the Hindu the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit, it's 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 roles. Definitely, yeah. So um, the <clears throat> you know when we read in the Bible, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Um, so that's what the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is talking about. That you know God dwells in us, um, and He. Uh, You know what? Let me let me not take too much. Uh, we touched a little bit upon this in the home groups. That's why I'm kind of trying to figure out. I, my brains are all short circuiting right now. But um, indwelling is something that every believer has. So as we pray to the God, the Spirit of God, like Romans 8, helps us to pray. Uh, he's the one who convicts us when we are in sin. He's the one who illumines the Spirit, the Word of God for us as we read. So every believer has this. Uh, Spirit of God indwelling us. So God's Spirit is with us all the time. Now the filling of the Spirit is a, is something different. In fact, I think um, uh, a good question is how can you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Um, I think, um, I think. let me just quote Ephesians 5. Um, Do not be filled with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and let me <laughs> try to finish it by opening up the scriptures. I should remember that. Does somebody else know the rest of the verse? <coughs> oh, it just says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Um, and uh, the... The 
parallel passage from Ephesians 5 is in, I think, Colossians 3. And there it talks about, uh, it's actually a very similar, these two books are very similar. And the parallelism is from there, be filled with the word of God. So the, how do you be filled with the spirit is by uh, filling yourself with the word of God and uh, relying upon God uh, for his aid. And um, maybe I, I might find something more to send it to you, uh, send it to all of you uh, after class. All right. Hey, Pradeep. Hi, Pradeep. Yes. Uh, Harry? So Harry had some good stuff in his pneumatology class a few years ago. Um, and he talked a lot about the different, you know, filling, sealed, you know, all the, you know, what's the ministry of the work of the Holy Spirit. So. Oh, that's great. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Uh, and I have those, I mean, I have so, the documents, so I could, I could email those out if you want. Oh, that'll be perfect. Thank you. That would be great. Thank you. So Jonathan, is that available online or? Uh, I will send out a link. Um, all of that stuff is being moved to Moodle for kind of the old classes, um, but okay. it's kind of in process. But I can put those up, you know, tonight if you want. Okay, thank you. Man, <laughs> you're not just a tech guy. <laughs> Okay, I just taken down a note so I can get some material. Good, good. Um, sorry for you to dwell on the same thing again and again. So uh, you said that every believer is given the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, and that's something. Uh, it's something that is purely in the New Testament. That's correct. Yes. So how about people like Abraham and Jacob and Isaac? Did they have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? In the Old Testament, what you have is the Spirit of God coming upon the people of God um, at distinct times and in distinct events. But you don't have uh, the Spirit of God um, continually dwelling with them. Um, and I think that is one of the promises that is fulfilled after the coming of Christ with the Pentecost. So, so yeah. um, if Abraham was a regenerated soul, um, would he not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Um, actually, yeah, no, that's a great question. So because I think when we think of regeneration, we think of regeneration and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit as being tied together. Um, but I think the way we want to think of this is Abraham was a believer. I mean, there's no question about that. Now, the question is, uh, what is the role of the Holy Spirit pre-Pentecost? So, you know, you have... Uh, Christ talking about it, I think in John, John 17, maybe, uh, where he says, you know, uh, I will send the Holy Spirit to you. And then even in John 20, he says, you know, receive the Holy Spirit. So there is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is something that doesn't happen until after the Pentecost itself. So the, they are believers. It doesn't mean that Abraham was not a believer. It's just that uh, they did not have the Spirit of God in the manner in which the New Testament saints do. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Uh, any other questions before we move on? All right. So let's uh, pick up with David as king. So with the death of Saul, uh, as you know, uh, Saul was anointed as king, and then he kind of picks up the mantle after the first battle. David was anointed, but it was more of an anointing by Samuel as a prefigure of what was to happen. So as long as Saul was alive, David always saw him as the anointed one, and he would not lift his hand against him until God brought him down in the way that God intended for him. So now that Saul is dead, David now becomes king over Judah. So he is from Bethlehem. He is from the tribe of Judah, and he rules in Hebron as his capital for seven years. And um, at this point, you have um, uh, one of the sons of Saul ruling uh, over Israel. And uh, so you have um, uh, an uneasy uh, situation between the uh, Abner uh, and Joab. Abner is the uh, general on the uh, Saul's descendant side and Joab is the uh, general on uh, David's side and also his relative 
And uh, so there is some trickery and some deception going on, but uh, David wants to be very careful in the manner in which he handles it. But soon he is made king over Israel as well. And so when David now becomes the king over all of Israel, he moves his capital to Jerusalem, mainly because Jerusalem, as you know, is uh, the Jebusites. This is the one of the last remaining towns, which is not really major capitals of the Israelites. And it's like on the borderline between Judah and the rest of the places. It's neither a center of Judah nor a center of Israel. And this will, the rest of Israel, and this now will become the main center moving forward from here. So this is one of the maps of um, Jerusalem from, um, from the top. So uh, what you have here is on the, the, you can actually see the walls of uh, Jerusalem, but these are later walls. The place where David would rule is in the bottom side on the dark um, um, oval shape that covers the, the top. That's the place where uh, David would be ruling at this point in time. Uh, so the manner in which it is taken over, uh, there is a spring called the Gaihan Spring, which was uh, this captain, British captain Charles Warren uh, discovered this in 67. But uh, in the scriptures, we have uh, Joab, who actually goes down through the spring and then enters into Jerusalem to take over it. And so this is a modern picture of the spring. So you have water that is stored there and you have this referred in a few places in the scriptures. So you have this walled city, which is uh, now taken over by David and he makes it his capital. So uh, in addition uh, to taking over uh, Israel, there is also good relationship between David and his neighbors. So you have uh, Tyre, uh, Hiram, king of Tyre, um, gives him cedar trees, a carpenters, stonemasons, and they build a palace for David. And um, David realized that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. So there is a fulfillment of what God had promised to David coming to pass as he becomes king and rules over the land. Um, so now you have uh, battles that go on. So now, as, we, as you've seen, God has already uh, uh, anointed David. God has equipped David. And now God is going to uh, use him in fighting against the enemies, the Philistines, who are the ones who last fought against Saul and killed him. And in uh, the Valley of Rephaim, uh, David asks God, should I go? God says, yes, I'll give them into your hand. And so he comes into this place. And um, so there's going to be a few word. Um, Hebrews got a little bit of a poetry to it. So just bear with me as I try to make this connection. David comes to this play, place called Baal Perazim and um, defeated the, them. There is a Philistines there. And he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of waters. Therefore, he named the place. Baal Perazim. Um, so uh, the word Perez, as you know, one of the sons of Judah, uh, it's like to bro break through. And so he uh, uses this name of breaking through as how God has delivered the Philistines into his hands. It's a, it's a poetic language, and uh, that term will be used in a few times here, especially in relationship to the Ark of the Covenant. So if you remember the last time we saw the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines had uh, had enough of it. They sent it back. It was staying in the Israelite border. And so, um, David wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant uh, back to Jerusalem. So they place the Ark of God on a new cart that they may bring it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So here uh, you know what happens. Um, uh, this cart stumbles and then Uzzah tries to uh, protect the cart, uh, protect the ark by holding it and then God strikes him down. And so when they came to the threshing fold of Nacon, Uzzah reached out and then the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and God struck him down there for his irreverence and he died there by the ark of the Lord. And David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. Once again, it's um, the outburst in chapter 5. You see the outburst of God against the enemy, 
but here it was against Uzzah. And again, this is one of those passages that sometimes um, confuses people. It's like, well, he had a, probably a good intention uh, that the ark wouldn't roll down the valley. And once again, it just reminds us of the holiness of God and what um, the careful instructions that we've been seeing in the Pentateuch about how the ark must be handled, how only the high priest can approach it, and that too once a year. And there is a reason why God uh, would be seen as holy and the sinful hands are not actually aiding the ark, but rather there is a judgment that comes upon a man when he uh, tries to um, deal with God on his own. Uh, the right approach, of course, would have been not to use this cart, but rather to have poles done the way that Moses had prescribed. And uh, when, when uh, David realizes this, he will then have it done the right way. Now, um, but immediately after this, David was unwilling to move the Ark of the Lord into the city of David with him. City of David is Jerusalem. But uh, David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Thus the Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Uh, so then D David hears about the blessings and then he's like, okay, <laughs> I think I need to bring the Ark back. And uh, he does bring the ark back uh, and this time with sacrifices and uh, with uh, the manner in which he was supposed to bring it. So um, then we have the event of David and Bathsheba. Now um, there are, while David is a man after God's own heart in the manner in which he trusts him, in the manner in which he rely, he does not fear man on, on, on account of, of God. Uh, but rather trust in God in, in the face of um, great opposition. Uh, one of his um, weak spots happens to be uh, women. He marries many women, and we're going to see that in a bit, the problems that it causes. But um, the chief sin that I think you know we see in uh, Psalm 51, in fact, um, I was thinking of Psalm 51. Um, if you remember, uh, we're talking to Suresh's earlier question. David says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. And um, he can recollect what happened in the life of Saul when the Spirit of God departed from, from Saul. And uh, he knows that there is a... Uh, uh, I, I believe that that is one of those things just in the dispensation of the Old Testament saints. While we can lose the joy of the Spirit, uh, we don't lose the dwelling of the Holy Spirit as New Testament believers. But anyway, back to David and Bathsheba. You know the events. So I'm not going to take too much time explaining it. Uh, Bechiba, uh, David, uh, his armies are out at war. David does not go out to war, which is again what I think initiates this whole problem. He stands in this, on his palace, looks down, sees Bechiba, um, covets her rather than turn away. You know, when you see, when you're tempted, you turn away from temptation, but he dwells on it. Then uh, finds out who she is, and when she you know, finds out she's married, he could have stopped right there. But again, he um, uh, plans a deception, has her brought over. And then she conceives, and then now he tries to get Uriah the Hittite. His Hittite, so he is someone from the, from not from Israel, who has come and allied himself with Israel, probably a convert to Judaism. And this man is so honorable that he would not um, go to his home while Israel was at war, while David here was sinning um, against Bathsheba and then against Uriah by sending him uh, to his death, murdering him. Uh, through Joab, and Joab will remember this um, uh, sinfulness of David in in uh, in the events in the future. But um, Ur Uriah gets killed, and then uh, when Uriah is dead, David brings Bathsheba uh, into his home. And um, this is a few months later, and uh, he David, and sometimes sin is like this when you sin can make up all these reasons that David made, and then uh, he seems to think that everybody's kind of gotten over it, or he's covered it well enough. And then God brings the prophet Nathan, uh, brings him, uh, shows this parable of uh, the rich man and the poor man who had a, a sheep, and then the rich man taking the beloved sheep of the poor man and sacrifice and killing it for uh, the visitor that he had. And David gets enraged, and God uses this um, conscience of David to convict him of his sin. And then um, 
David repents, right? Psalm 51. And you can see the uh, heart of David in following after God. And that's what uh, should characterize the believers. Believers are not perfect. Believers are not sinless. But believers are convicted by the Holy Spirit and humble themselves. Uh, just as they humble themselves the very first time, they will humble themselves each time uh, this, they sin and confess their sins before God and receive forgiveness. And in this particular case, the son of David dies, a son that is born to Bathsheba dies, uh, but a future son of Bathsheba, um, uh, Solomon, will end up being king. Although that's probably not the king that David himself was looking to be the ruler. So now let's, uh, and through this sin, there is a curse that is given to David and the, and the suffering that he, and he faces in his life. So uh, even as for us as believers, you know, our penalty of sin is paid for, uh, the guilt is washed away, but there are consequences here on earth. And one of the consequences is this troubled family of David. David had many wives, three other wives are mentioned here. His firstborn is Amnon, born to Ahinoam. And then he has, um, uh, Absalom and Tamar uh, born to one of his wives and then you have Solomon with Bathsheba and uh, you have um, sin in the life in the family of David where Amnon um, violates Tamar and, and, and pushes her out. Absalom is upset with David for not dealing with Amnon's sin um, and he plots revenge and then he kills Amnon uh, in a feast. And then uh, David doesn't deal with Absalom's sin. And when Absalom goes into hiding, and then when Absalom comes back um, through the wilds of Joab, um, uh, David still doesn't reconcile properly. You can just see a history of just parental failure of David uh, as his children showcase the same weaknesses that he himself had. And uh, here you have um, Absalom, who, whom David loves, um, but who will tear his heart uh, by rebelling and going for the throne. And uh, ultimately, Absalom will chase David out of, uh, out of uh, Jerusalem, and uh, he will commit some heinous sins that were prophesied by Nathan to David. And uh, ultimately, um, David will be given victory over Absalom, um, but it would be a very painful victory because David loves Absalom. Uh, it is, he loses either way. When he wins the battle, he loses his son and his heart is broken. And uh, finally, Solomon will be the one who will pick up the mantle after David. I'm kind of giving you a big picture, but we're going to look at some of the details in the next few slides. So here is some parallelism between the sin of David and that of his children. So you have David and Bathsheba, uh, Amnon and Tamar. Uh, David commits adultery, uh, Amnon um, violates Tamar, uh, David uh, kills Uriah, Absalom kills Amnon. Um, and here is a picture of uh, the Mount of Olives looking from Jerusalem. And so when uh, Absalom is coming to take over Jerusalem, David is walking with his faithful entourage going down and up into the uh, Mount of Weeping. So he went up the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered. It's just abject shame. This is not the image of a king. And you can just see the consequence of David's sin uh, in his own family. And uh, here you have a picture of Absalom's death. Uh, he had a hair that was tangled in a tree. And then uh, the soldiers would not kill him. But Joab knows that politically, uh, even though David loves Absalom, the right thing to do is to destroy the enemy of the anointed one, and he kills uh, Absalom. And you have this power uh, struggle in one sense, as Joab has to coax David to take back the throne rather than grieve for uh, Absalom. And uh, you once again see um, Absalom. Um, David is just a man like us, and he has his flaws, um, but by the grace of God, he rules and dies as the king. All right, so with that, uh, we finished uh, Second Samuel, and uh, we're going to be picking up um, um, First Kings, and we'll finish from First Kings all the way to Esther next week. But uh, I think we 
Actually, we are about time. Um, I, I thought we had a few more minutes. Uh, is there any questions um, in what we've seen here in the life of David? I kind of rushed very fast through this. I hope the events are very familiar with all of you. I haven't asked you to read um, all of these texts, so I know that some of it may not be fresh in your mind. But um, I would recommend that if you have time to read more of it, uh, more of the, uh, uh, the scriptures than you are actually required to read uh, for your readings. Uh, I actually skipped all the Samuel uh, Kings and Chronicles, hoping that it is familiar to you all. All right, so let me stop here. Any questions? Not for me. Okay. Um, all right then, so uh, this is our penultimate class, so I know Suresh, you won't be here next week, uh, but um, I'll wish you a safe journey, hope you are, uh, you get well uh, before you leave. Thanks, buddy. Uh, and for the rest of you, uh, next week, hopefully we'll meet in, uh, in class, so we can meet face to face for our final class, and I'll have the quiz for this one opened up tomorrow and the final quiz the week after. And any questions, please email me or Jonathan, and uh, hopefully we can take care of it. Um, Jonathan, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Um, why, why don't you close this in prayer, Jonathan? Sure. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time where we could just study your word. We thank you for uh, just the preparation that uh, that Pradeep has done to to bring all this uh, truth from the Old Testament to us. Um, and Father, would you uh, just help these truths and uh, and just the the truth of your Scripture just to rest in our hearts, Father, that we might uh, just glorify you more, to understand you better. Um, and uh, and Father, we again we just desire that for you to receive all the glory for for every study of the Bible that we do. Uh, for your glory and for our benefit. And we just pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pradeep, as always. A great job. Thanks, Pradeep. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>